Resource Nation. Join us now for Family Mix Mondays with licensed professional counselor, Jaquitra Bryant. Tune in as Jaquitra shows the different dynamics that make up family. Whether you represent the nuclear family, single parent, extended, grandparent, or blended family, Jaquitra has tips and advice designed to strengthen your family structure. Source Nation, here is your host, Jaquitra Bryant. Good evening, Source Nation. I am your host, Jaquitra Bryant, and I want to welcome you to Family Mix Mondays, which is a show where I have committed myself to breaking generational cycles, talking about all those things that we think about in our head but dare to come out with so that we can promote some healthy conversations within our families and really some healthy ways of interacting with our children, our teens, our young adults, so we can have better families and better parenting. And so tonight I am starting a new series. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Yes, yeah, so I'm excited. I always get excited about, like, the new series because this is something that I've, like, thought long about, like, this topic. And so I, I really like to uh, focus on a lot of these factors that I feel like are breaking our families down. And so one of the factors that I feel like are breaking our families down is what we model. Y'all remember that saying, do as I say, not as I do, that our parents used to tell us? I don't know if you had some parents that did that, but I know a few of my friends and neighbors, and I'm sure my mom here and there, aunt or uncle or grandmother said, do as I say, not as I do. Do as I say, not as I do. And so how much did that help us? <laughs> All of those who are not millennials now, who are in a different generation, and who are actually saying those same words to your children, but yet find your children doing exactly the opposite, doing exactly what you do, and not the things that you say. So why is that? Good question, right? That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the positive parenting, modeling positive parenting. What you model makes all the difference as to what you will produce. All of like work ethics, right? Like we can go to work, we resume say that we're qualified for the position, but our work is going to make all the difference as to what our work looks like and the time we put in it and the investment in ourselves, the investment in what we do and other people, we then begin to see the fruit of it, actually. And so that's, that's part scripture. Actually, that is scripture. Whatever you do, you see the fruit of what you do. And so if that holds true, that if we do positive things, we re- receive positive results, then the same holds true if we do negative behaviors then we have fruit that are bad, that are rotten, that are negative, that are a reflection, actually, of the things that we're doing in life. So sometimes, not all the cases, because there are cases of mental illness, there are cases of chemical imbalance, there are cases of other factors, there are so many environmental factors, but as a parent a guardian, you have so much influence. And I'm going to show you on this series how to get your influence in a positive light, modeling positive things so that your children can be a reflection of all those things that you're working on, and you can begin now seeing the fruit of that. Before we get into that, I have a guest that you've heard before, and she was so insightful. Like her and I just kept on going back and forth, bouncing things off. So I know tonight is just going to like <laughs> blow your mind with her wisdom, her insight, her her books that she's written, her her just charisma, just just who she is, just really um, blows my mind actually. And so. Before she joins us, um, I just want to stop and thank our sponsors, and they are Zulina Health, Wellness, and Fitness, Paper to Film Production, Revolution Meals, Renovations, Meet My Types Matchmaking, Blend to Blend Juice Bar Boutique, Urban Grand Sand Digital, and New Covenant Prairie Forship Center. And after the break, we have my guest, you guessed it, Diane Lang, joining us in the studio. Source Nation, stay tuned. You're listening live to Family Mix Mondays with your host, 
Jakeetra Bryant. Radio Network is just one of the many platforms that is used to fulfill dreams of our listeners and create a purpose that will impact the lives of our community, city, and the world. It is often said that great things will happen when a group of driven people work together to accomplish one goal. We're giving people the opportunity to have a voice, translate words that haven't been heard, and paint pictures that no one has seen. Source Radio Network is fueling your life's purpose. How can you listen? www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash source radio. Time to evaluate Nation, you're listening live to Family Mix Mondays with your host, Chiquita Bryant. Welcome back, Source Nation. Again, I'm your host, Chiquita Bryant, and you're listening to Family Mix Mondays. As stated before the break, we are starting a new series of positive 
modeling, positive parenting modeling. And so we have Diane Lang who's going to join me in the studio. But before she joins me and I tell you more about her, um, the artist that you just heard was Rachel Shaw. The song was Fail For You. And She'll be in the studio with host James Johnson at 3.15 on Saturday. So make sure you tune back in and listen to some of that great music. And so let me tell you more about Diane. So Diane Lang is a therapist, an educator, and a life coach. As a therapist, educator, and positive living expert, Diane has dedicated her career to helping people turn their lives around and is now on a mission to help them develop a sustainable, positive attitude that can actually turn one into an optimist literally. Through her three books, Creative Balance and Finding Happiness, Baby Steps, The Path from Motherhood to Career, and Mindfully Happy, Waking Up to Life, Diane has been speaking and empowering people nationwide. She is also an adjunct in psychology at Montclair State University, where her college work includes mentoring students for personal issue advisement. She's also been on a host of shows, y'all, like, I mean, in magazines, like Daily Record, Family Circle, Family Magazine, Working Mother Magazine and Cookie Magazine, um, CSB TV and Fox and Friends, and just so much more. And so I'm going to let her just tell you more, because reading about it just does no justice. Actually hearing it from the mouth of a person with all this wisdom and experience and this great conversation. And so I do believe we have Ms. Diane Lang in the studio. Hello, Diane. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for joining me today. Why don't you go ahead and tell Source Nation a little bit more about you. Hi. Well, first, thank you so much for having me. It's so great to be back. So I hope all is well with you. Yes. So, yes. So many new things. <laughs> <laughs> so everything is good, just really busy. Um, as you probably know, um, the kids are off for spring break the last week, so it's been a little crazy, and I'm sure you've been feeling the same way. Yes, oh my goodness. <laughs> so I need a spring break. <laughs> I know. We need a vacation together. Let's just go. <laughs> I know, right? I'm like, we don't we don't get a mommy one. <laughs> <laughs> a mommy vacation. I like that. A mom cation. That would be excellent. Right. They always call what do they call those things, those staycations. And so like I'm like, Well, I want a mom vacation. Something. I'm with you. I think that would be perfect. <laughs> Yeah, so I was telling Source Nation about you, but, you know, of course, reading it does no justice. And so tell them any new things you got going on since the last time we talked and, and just, like, just, just any more things about you. Sure. Well, um, my new book just came out, which is called Mindfully Happy, Waking Up to Life, and I'm really excited about it because it's a mix of tips for both mindfulness and happiness, and together when we have that com- you know, combination of both mindfulness and happiness, we can feel resilient, optimistic, we can have less stress, and as a parent, having both of those resources you know, to be able to be more mindful and to cultivate happiness together really makes a difference. And I just finished up a women's wellness retreat this weekend. I just finished it this afternoon, and it was all moms, and it was so great to be able to teach all of that because that is the biggest thing we hear from parents is, you know, I'm so stressed out. I don't have any time to myself. I don't have time for self-care, and my kids took all my money, so I'm just feeling so stressed and anxious, and I feel unbalanced, and it was nice to see all these moms and grandmoms, too. There was, it was a great combination coming there to really just refresh and reboot and have a mom vacation, which you and I need. Mm-hmm. So next time I'm I going to a mom vacation instead of a speaker, but it was really a great experience right. to see all of these women taking the time to do what they need to do to refresh so they can come back and be better moms, you know, better parents in general, better friends, all of that, you know, better in their career because they feel refreshed and reboot. So it was a really good experience. Yeah, like it sounds like it. Oh, my goodness, as you were talking, I was like, oh, I want there. I want to go there. I want to, like, just be. And so it is. I, I, I think I work so hard. And, and so today my son, during breakfast, I had to try my best to go into a poker face moment. He was like, you are so nice on vacation. And I was like, wait, what? I was like, are you trying to say I'm not nice right now? <laughs> and so he was like, no, 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 you're nice. <laughs> and so, and I had this just really, because I'm really promoting talking and promoting that it's okay to talk to me. It doesn't matter, like, like what you say, I want, I, I want him to assert himself. Um, and so I was just, I said, Christian, it's okay if, if, if you thought that mommy 
was um, a lot nicer then. And then today I have a snappy attitude. It's fine to say it. I said, because mommies work on themselves too. And so I was like, so, and it's okay. And I have to know that maybe I have a bad attitude today and I need to take a moment and take a breath. And so um, he was like, no, you're fine today. (laughs) (laughs) That's so funny. But but I think he was really implying that I was snappy (laughs) at breakfast. You know what? It's okay because it shows him that you're human and that we do all have our bad and good days. And it also shows him that he's able to talk to you, tell you how he feels, even if it's telling you, hey, Mom, you know, you're not so happy today or you're being cranky. It's good that he can express that to you and that he can feel comfortable talking to you and that you're okay listening to him because that's how we really become that positive parent, by being the mom or dad who apologizes, who admits to mistakes and failures, to have, to have the ability to have those conversations with our kids. That's what makes the whole difference. It's really a great yep. experience that you were able to do that. Yeah, and that's why I had to, like, pause. I was like, wait a minute. I was like, this can go either way. And that just kind of goes me back into, our like, our subject. That is why we're on the, mo- like, the positive parenting modeling and for this series. And so I really want to talk about that. Like, what we do as parents sets the tone for way more than how they parent or how they're in a relationship. It, it sets the tone for classroom behavior, street behavior, the market, as people call it, um, all kind of behaviors. It sets the tone for it. And so I want to talk about that. And then I love how you mentioned it. Is it makes us all human. So let's start with that, Diane. Let's start with like, how many times um, <laughs> have you heard the phrase like "do as I say, not as I do" um, by one of our parents, our aunts, uncles, grandparents in the past? And it just really just you know kind of I know for me it really confused me. And it doesn't say that we're human. It, is, it doesn't say that we can like have mistakes and kind of bounce back from it. So what do you think about those phrases that we grew up in? You know, it's so funny as you say that a few things come to my mind. So the phrase you said comes in, and then the other ones are like, don't do that. And as a child, you'd say, why? And they'd say, because I said so, or because oh, I'm oh my mom, God, mom yes. parent. <laughs> right? I hated those because you're, you're so right. What yes. you did is, it, you know, it made you maybe obey and be disciplined, but you still never knew what you did wrong or if you did anything wrong, so you'd repeat the behavior over. And it was confusing because you never understood why they didn't want you to have that behavior. So, you know, it was kind of the same way, like, you know, when a, a stove was hot, you'd go to touch it as a little kid, and your mom would go, don't touch that. And they'd, you know, maybe, like, push your hand away or hit it. And you wouldn't do it, mm-hmm. but you never knew why. They never explained, well, this is hot, this could burn you and hurt you. So you would do it again until you eventually learned it the hard way. And when they don't explain it to us and they don't give us the details, we don't know that our behavior is either wrong, if there's such a thing. You know, I'm not a big fan of wrong or mistakes, but we don't realize that what we're doing could be harmful to ourselves or hurt others unless parents do what we call induction, which is to really sit down and explain to their child in, you know, very simple terms, especially knowing the age and the maturity of the child, but really explaining, hey, this is why this is not good or this is not healthy or how this could harm you or harm others and how it would be great if you could do this instead. And kids listen when you give them options. So instead of saying, you know, no, don't go in the street and get the ball, if you say something like, no, you know what, wait on the curb and mommy will get the ball, then they know what to do. So we really need to explain more. We need to be more open to explaining what's going on and doing the induction. And as parents, it would make such a big difference in a child's life. I agree. I agree. I think it it just – I, I think for me, um, when it came to parenting, I remember, like, I think I had, like, a, one upper hand on my mom only because by the time I became a parent, like, I was literally in the midst of getting my master's when I gave birth. And so I was, like, at my first three courses. And so right. I was able to dive into more of the, the, the psychology of a person, the human development of a person, and, and really look at that. But I still, by this point, because I'm just, like, really diving into the clinical parts of it, I didn't really understand the impact that my childhood and my mom's parenting had on me. And so I literally had to, like, oh, go undo all that stuff, as well as tie into the 
like what I knew about human development. So I was really torn. And I remember my family saying things like, well, I, we did that to you. That didn't hurt you. And I'm thinking, I think it did, actually. <laughs> so. I know. It, it, it's funny. You know, for me, I came from – uh, an abusive childhood. So for me, I actually did the opposite. Like I learned to not do what my parents did because I knew how it harmed me. And sometimes you don't have the ability to do that. And I think the reason I was is just what you said is I was in grad school and it made me challenge everything and question everything. And you start learning how you have the ability to make those changes and change behaviors and that they stem all the way from childhood. So Thank God for graduate school. It's the most expensive form right. of counseling I ever had. But it really does allow right. you to make that shift, which a lot of people don't have. You know, they don't have that ability. They don't have the knowledge, the coping skills. They don't even know that it's possible. So I think we're blessed in that way to do it. So, I think so too. But it is important for us to look at how our parents – you know, raised us, and not that it would be negative because a lot of people have good relationships with their parents. So, But it's looking at it and seeing how you can improve what did it work for you, what did work, what do you want to take with you from your childhood, and what do you want to change or challenge. And this way we can just keep growing. Even if our parents were good, we can grow and learn from the, you know, the things that we didn't think worked or weren't as successful mm-hmm. or just are different because our society with technology and the differences that we have going on. So we need to keep improving and growing as parents just because the world is changing. Right, I agree. I think, like, let's take it from that point. Um, you said something that just really just kind of jogged me um, sure. when it comes to, like, I guess the parents and not really saying, hey, you were a bad parent. But, like, how can a parent now know if they are indeed picking up some behaviors that was modeled to them that might not be working with their parenting style with their children. Do you think there are actual visible signs that parents can actually see? Well, I think for a parent, I think it's a few things. One, it's really being honest with yourself. And it's also looking at the relationship you have with your children. And we can get a feel, you know, by looking at the relationship, like I have a 15-year-old, and looking at my relationship, I can tell that I'm not perfect and I'm not the greatest parent out there, but I'm doing okay because we have a good relationship. And she's able to come to me and talk to me and express if she's feeling hurt or has something going on. And that's big. And you can see that when relationships are healthy, and again, healthy doesn't mean perfect by any means, so none of us should be harder ourselves nobody's perfect there is no perfect parent but when you're being a good parent or the type of parent you want to be there's usually good communication and there's good ability for the child no matter the age and gender to come to you and and talk to you and that shows a sign of a healthy relationship there will be fights there'll be disagreements that's also part of a healthy relationship and I also think parents need to look and follow their own intuition and know themselves and know you know what am I feeling without you know being a perfectionist without trying to control everything and being realistic, really ask yourself, you know, how am I doing? And what did I learn Mm -hmm. from my children? Because we're always learning as well. And, you know, asking yourself, is there good communication here? Am I able to understand and know my child? Those are some really big questions to ask. But what I've noticed is, you know, when we ask parents, you know, on a score of 1 to 10, what type of parent are you? Where would you put yourself? You know, 10 being the best, 1 being the worst. Most people give themselves such a low score even when their children don't. So we tend to be really hard on ourselves. So we want to be realistic and we don't want to be perfectionist because that's an impossibility. And we, want, we don't want to raise our kids to try for perfection because it sets them up for mm-hmm. failure. So it's really looking, is there communication? Am I spending quality time? What does my gut intuition say? Am I learning from my past mistakes, from my own childhood? And you can take it from there. It gives you somewhat of a guideline. And you can even talk to your spouse. Um, and say, how do you think we're doing, and discuss it. Or even, you know what, you can even ask your kids as they're older, you know, how are you feeling? Is there anything you think I could do better as a parent? I want to be here for you. Just like we say to our kids, I need you to do this. You need better grades. You need to take out the laundry. You know, I need you to step up to the plate and grow up. We can ask our, you know, kids, hey, how are we doing? And, it's, you know, mm-hmm. again, keep it realistic and at the level of their maturity. But it's great to be open and have those kind of conversations. I think so, too. I think the whole do as I say, not as I do, and those statements, like, because I said so, puts a parent at a certain role where we can't be a student as well. And I remember about, like, uh, maybe, like, 
a year and a half, maybe two years ago, I became a student to my son. And one, because I was like, oh, my goodness, this kid is cutting up in school. I'm the therapist. Like, he should be, like, the star student. I was so wrong. But I think it was all one. I think it was God doing something so I can be more attentive to a whole bunch of things. And then it allowed me to come to such a humbling place in my life to realize, like, nope, he's a human too. He's in this world too. And he's exploring and learning and, and like, it didn't come with a manual. <laughs> and so, like, I think the no, student part – Right. It did not. Those books, they just helped me during the birth canal part. Like, other than that, yeah, no. <laughs> so, and so, um, and so, yeah, and so, like, I think what helped me is to realize that I needed to take the time to get to know him, and I needed to, like, recognize who I am and my baggage and my brokenness and any healing that needed to take place and, and all that. I I realized all that was going together. And so I want to help some of our parents with that, realizing that, like, believe it or not, you don't just, because you're pregnant, you don't just be like, yep, he's here, she's here, it's going to be just a perfect life. There's some stuff that we can bring into this child that we can model bad behavior. And so I want to talk briefly about those factors there. And so, like, um, what are some cases that you've seen where it literally was like, oh, my goodness, this person's baggage of maybe a relationship or their baggage of how the relationship was with their parents? Um, You're seeing the impact of their parenting. Have you seen some cases like that? I have. I mean, I have seen, you know, believe it or not, I see it a lot also in college. You know, a lot of the students who are coming you know, because I teach college, and a lot of the students who are psych majors, I have them write an autobiography. That's one of my assignments in my psych class. And when I read them over and we discuss a lot of it, you can see how their childhood has really affected them. And a lot of psych students, people coming to be therapists and counselors and social workers and all of that, they really a lot of times come from a place of dysfunction or a place of where they've been hurt or feel abandoned. So it has affected them. And, you know, a lot of the psych students, thank God it's affected them in a good way because that's why they want to go and help others. But for a lot of people, it really just makes you stuck and frozen. It can numb you that you don't want to feel and you put up a wall. It can cause self-destructive behaviors. I mean, there's so much that it can do. You know, but on the other hand, it could also make you a better parent and a better educator, a better therapist, whatever it is you're going for. So it's how we decide to use it. But I do see it on both sides, to be honest. You know, I've seen it work both ways. And even for myself, you know, having um, not great role models growing up on both sides, I was able to use that, my childhood, to say what I don't want to do. And I've seen other people do that too, other clients being like, you know, I didn't have a great upbringing and I didn't have a good you know, good parenting, but what happened is I learned what I didn't want by that. I learned not to behave that way, not to do that to my child. So you can use it in both ways. So even if you're coming from a dysfunctional background like myself, whether it's abuse or just neglect or just not a good childhood in general, um, you can still learn from that experience. So, you know, for me, I always say it was the best thing that happened to me. Don't get me wrong, don't want to go back to my childhood and relive it, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but it made me the person I am today. And if I didn't have that, I don't think I'd have the purpose and passion that I have to help people, and it wouldn't have put me in the right direction where I needed to be. So we all have experiences that really make us stronger, that challenge us, that make us grow, and then we can use it to be, you know, great, not just as a parent, but even in our careers and our relationships. So there is a lot of good, and we can have post-traumatic growth from it. So we don't have to even look at our childhood as a negative once we can heal from it. Yeah, I agree. Every time you talk, I'm just like, that sounds like me too (laughs) in my life. And so that's how it was for me growing up too. And I think like, I think sometimes I've I've sat back and I've tried to figure out like, man, what's, what's so different about the fact that like we saw it differently. And so I think that's why like the platform about breaking generational cycles is so important for me um, as I created this to, to talk more about like conversations because like, like I think the only thing one, yes, we had that um, grad school experience, but I think maybe we, maybe someone did plant some seed. Maybe someone did jog something in our thoughts that we were just like, oh, that sounds pretty good. I didn't think about it that way. I didn't think about how my role looked. I didn't think about how much power I did have. 
or do have when it comes to parenting and doing it differently. And so um, I want to give people that same opportunity. It seems like that you and I saw something more than what we, like, were living in. And so, um, and so I think, yeah, like, I think sometimes, like, um, when I think of, I guess, like, when, like, I, I'm around other parents, um, and I know they're older than me, and so, but I know they also are always seeking advice from me. <laughs> and so sometimes I'm thinking, like, man, and it really does not have anything to do with age. And I want to, like, free our Source Nation family by talking about that part when it comes to modeling, that it doesn't matter if you are this young teen who happened to get pregnant to um, however the oldest person is that's pregnant that's listening or just had a baby, that there is something you can do to model um, a more positive interaction so that your child can begin modeling that. Well, it's important to be that role model, like you said, and to observe. And, you know, just something you said before that really stuck out for me is, you know, how we might have seen something and, you know, we want to have other people have that ability. I know for me, even if you've come from a place of dysfunction, what I've noticed is if you have one person in your life who cares, like for me it was my brother. My brother took on the parenting role for probably about the first eight to ten years of my life. And then it got rough because he got married and moved because everybody's so much older than me. But having that one person who loved me and gave me unconditional love is really what shifted it for me. And I've noticed from studies and from my own clients, and you probably have too, is if you have somebody in your life who gives you, who's that good role model, who gives you unconditional love, and it could be another sibling, a grandparent, it could be a teacher, a coach, it could be a next-door neighbor, it doesn't matter, but having that one person who can be the role model, who shows that unconditional love, that acceptance, that belonging, that can make a difference in all of our lives. So, you know, it doesn't always have to be your parents who make that difference for you. It could be grandparents, it could be a brother or sister, it, it could be, you know, a coach or a teacher, but if somebody steps up to the plate and takes over that role model and uses, you know, their abilities and strengths to make you a better person and shows that unconditional love, we could still have a really great, successful adult life. So, you know, our parents aren't the only people that cause the, you know, nurture part of our lives, and we can look past that, and when you have support from other places, you can still really move forward. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I think that's one thing to add, too, like positive parenting modeling is recognizing that that can happen, recognizing that, like, I know I'm a super busy mom, and um, one of my core values is having balance. So if every area isn't kind of running in unison, I feel as if, like, I'm not doing – I feel like as if I'm not doing good, and so I have to work on that part, too. But what I did is I put my son in Big Brothers Big Sisters program a year ago, and that young man was God sent. And he he just had so many similar values. It's as if, like, he was my older son because – we actually end up getting someone a little younger than the age group, so he could be like not really my son, but like a, a, a like a nephew or something. Right. And I think that was something that I had to recognize that like there is something that I'm modeling, but there is some other things that other people can model too, and that is still a reflection of parenting. Absolutely. It really yeah. is, and the big brother, big sister is so wonderful to have you know, in your town and every every state and, you know, city usually has that. And if not, I mean, you could even do it through sports. You could do it through Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts. I mean, there's so many ways. But getting that other role model who's younger, who's more their age, who they can connect with, sometimes makes the biggest difference. So, again, it doesn't have to be our parents. And we can look outside the box to make sure we have positive, you know, role models in our children's lives besides ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so, like, let's look at, like, some of the particular things. Um, you mentioned earlier about the communication. And so that is one model that we can start doing. So what do you suggest parents, um, how do you suggest they start off? So say communication, they've been this old school parent that's been like, do as I say, or because I said so, and all those kind of things. And now they actually want to communicate more. How do you suggest they start? that with, let's say, um, maybe the kid would be, let's go with the 
not the tween years. Let's go a little bit uh, uh, under the tween years, and then we'll do another scenario with them <laughs> above because that's a different type of conversation too. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I tell parents is when I'm teaching positive parenting, which is really for very young kids up to puberty, which, as we know, could be a variable of ages because we see puberty as young as 8, 9, starting the process mm-hmm. for the two years up to 14. But during those years, you know, that's when kids learn like sponges and, you know, they learn through observation and role modeling and imitation. So one of the things I tell parents is to look at their behavior because one of the best ways to be a communicator is to look at yourself and say, you know, a few things. So, you know, what negative comments do I say all day? Like starting to notice what's coming out of my mouth, such as, You know, when you're driving, yelling at the people in front of you or complaining about the traffic all the time or saying how ugly and fat you look when you're getting ready for work. Because those are normal comments that come out of people's mouths. I look horrible. I can't believe I'm wearing this. Oh, my God, I gained five pounds. I'm so fat. Or you're driving in, you know, so much traffic. You're like, I hate this. I can't stand living here in this traffic. And people annoy me. You know, what negativity comes out of your mouth or, you know, even about education, about teachers, about the economy, the president, what is coming out of your mouth? Because kids really pay attention to that. So you want to look at your negative statements that you're saying, and then you want to look at your negative nonverbals because that's another big one, looking at your facial gestures, mm-hmm. um, your eye rolls, your <sighs> the size that we make the eye contact or lack of eye contact. Because communication is not just what's coming out of your mouth. It's the attitude. It's the tone. It's the nonverbals. So you want to watch both things. What negative comments are coming out of my mouth about my child, my family, and just the world in general? Because we want them to have a glass half full, you know, kind of theory and be optimist, not pessimist. And also what attitude's coming out, even if it's not about them. Maybe you had a bad day at work. You just had a fight with your spouse. But still, what is coming across to them? So those are the things to start off because we just think of communication, you know, as the typical things we talk about in therapy. Okay, make sure everybody eats dinner together and make sure you have that quality time and there's no TV or technology, you know. And all of those are basics that are fabulous, and we know that. But what about the real stuff that we don't pay attention to that really phases our children? And then third is how are you showing love? So it's not just about saying I love you, which is powerful and great, but are you showing it? You know, what little kids notice is when they come off the bus at home and mom and dad are sitting there with the glow on their face and the big smile and their arms out ready to hug them. That's what kids remember. It's the actions as well. And also, not only are you showing love to your child, but how are you showing love to your spouse or significant other? Because kids look at that too. Are we treating all of our kids the same and giving them all unconditional love? Are we being kind and respectful to our spouses, to our friends? They look at the whole thing. So it's really looking at yourself as a parent. Instead of worrying about disciplining the child so much and going, you know, do what I say and because I'm the mom or dad, because I'm the boss, it's really about looking at yourself and saying, what do I want my children to have as a value system? How do I want them to communicate? Do I want them to critically think and be self-starters and kind? Then I have to be that person. And it's mm-hmm. really about self-awareness with yourself, especially for those ages, because that's mm-hmm. how kids learn. They're visual learners. So it's all about your tone, your attitude, your nonverbals, what are you saying and what are you showing. And when we can really get that together, then we can really make a difference in our kids' lives, especially up to like middle school age where puberty really sets in and then we got hormones and all of that. But, you know, if we can do that, we can really build a strong foundation. And that's so important because that strong foundation remains with them forever. So it's I love that you said that. I know. So many points you said. Mm -hmm. Right, right. They're going to be a whole nother. (laughs) Some of the points you said, I just thought about, like, when you were saying with the traffic, one day, Christian was so funny. Not not one day, a few days, (laughs) a few few incidents of these. (laughs) But I'm not even a person that, like, I don't yell at people. Like, I'm very, like, very mindful. Like, I am the typical, I guess, therapist and being aware of, like, everyone's emotions and being probably a little too hyper aware sometimes. But, that when I'm in a car, 
I, it's not like I'm yelling, but I'll say like, I'll say something like, oh my goodness, like, why did you pull out in front of me? Like, why would you do that? Like, you need to be mindful of everyone on the road. So it has so much like (laughs) processing with it when I say it. And so I'll notice my son, if somebody like, like I don't honk a horn at anybody, I'm really mindful of like, if it's going to scare them, like I said, I'm probably too hyper aware. (laughs) <laughs> and so he, when we'll be in the car, and if someone does something, I won't even say it most of the time. He'll be like, why did you do that? Like, you should be aware that people are right here, and you should blow your horn. <laughs> oh, <my laughs> God. Sounds like a stupid kid. You're in trouble. I know. And I know, and I just, like, look back. I was like, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, because he's not yelling. He's so calm, <laughs> and, he's, and he's thoroughly talking it through. <laughs> and so I was like, mm. I don't know how I should take that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it just made me think about when you said that. I was like, that's true, because you can be that yeller in traffic, and you watch your kid yell right with you <laughs> or do something. Oh, absolutely. Or, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I have a story like that, too. When I was, I, I mean, when my daughter was, I guess, about five, six, I was having one of those mornings that I was talking about that no matter what I tried on, it just didn't look good. You know, it was probably that time of the month, and, I was cranky, and I didn't get much sleep, and I'm trying on all these different outfits to go to work. And as I'm taking them off, I'm like, oh, I'm so ugly, I'm so fat. I was just so frustrated, and I don't really believe that about myself. But when I'm in that mood and nothing fits, and and all of a sudden, I didn't even think my daughter was there. I thought she was in her room playing. She came up to me, and she's like, well, if you're fat, I must be fat. And what a was for me, because I don't want to teach her bad body image issues. I don't want to teach her that she right. have eating disorder of any type, just by setting, I mean, there's so many standards out there just with society and the competition between social media and magazines and TV. The last thing she needs to hear is me. And it taught me such a lesson, even though, you know, a half hour later, I probably would have been fine. But we have those moments where we snap while driving or we just don't feel good or we don't feel we look good or it's hormonal because it's that time of the month. And we say things we don't mean. Or we go back mm-hmm. into our old tape deck of, you know, I should have done this, I could have done that. What's wrong with me? I'm such an idiot, you know. And we go back to those old bad patterns and habits. And right there when I heard that, I was like, I never wanted to say that again. And it really stopped me in my tracks, you know. Same thing as, like, traffic, like you said. So it's really about us as parents making the difference. Yep. It's so easy, to. Oh, my goodness, it's so easy, to. And I think that's why, and to be honest, like, my attitude this morning was primarily due to the fact that, like, I'm like, oh, hormonal change this month. And I was like, it, it will probably, like, if, if I model a certain way, to be honest, he probably will let me know when I need to be more aware, like, oh, i got a hormone change. I need to, like, <laughs> he's like, like, your mom. But like yeah, you said before at the beginning, model. Right, right. <laughs> like you said at the beginning, like um, if you begin to have that open line of communication, then they feel very safe to just say something back and not a way that it's like where it, you're going to like curse them out or you're going to like strike them or anything. Like I have tried my best to promote my son with a sense of confidence, with speaking up, with decision-making, with so many things. And he feels very comfortable like speaking up about a lot of things. That so much that my mom and my other family members were so surprised. They were just like, you're letting him choose this or – or he can ask that kind of question. I'm just like, yeah, like it's, there, it's not a, a violation of a boundary or something that's inappropriate. Like it's him asserting himself. And so I think like sometimes people may mix, mix up the two. Like just because a kid may be asking a question that maybe like, you know, how a parent can't answer. Maybe it's uncomfortable for a parent, but yet it's not inappropriate or anything. I think sometimes people may think that that is, you know, well, I'm the parent, so you you can find that out later in some years and how that's not very helpful when it comes to trying to communicate and model. I agree. This is why we talk well, because we're in total agreement. (laughs) I never meet people like this. I know, I know. Right, having a lot of the same going through similar things, you know, it really does reinforce what we need to do. So it's so great talking to you. I know every time I'm just like, oh, my goodness, this is so interesting. <laughs> what about, like, let's, okay, now let's help parents when it comes to their tweens. <laughs> and their, um, because I don't think it's ever too late. Like, I know, like, um, say if we have situations where a parent, like, 
you know, may be inheriting through blended families or may um, just any kind of situation when it comes to the person is now a teenager. And so, but you want to model good parenting because parenting is still necessary, even though they're teenagers, it's still necessary. So how can we help the parents then communicate and start the communication? What do you suggest there? You know, for me, what I have been telling my clients and parents and students is, and I use myself because, like I said, my daughter's 15, so I am in the middle of the teen years, um, is really to be an empathetic listener and an active listener. But, you know, we always go over active listening. You hear about it whether you're at work, you listen to it at school, they teach you it all over, you know. Good eye, t- eye contact, show that you're listening with nonverbals, summarize what they said, ask questions, never interrupt take a pause and before answering. I mean, we know all of that. So part of it's just remembering that. But the other part is really to be an empathetic listener because what happens are teens are in this mode that everything is very dramatic or chaos-driven and it's a crisis. And as an adult, we look at it and go, really? You know, you've only dated for two weeks. You're really upset about that? Or, wow, you know, you and your friend had a fight for the 20th time and you work itself out. And, of course, you know, we just... And we act the same way we just talked about, you know, like, because I said so. We do the same thing. Like, it's not a big deal. You know, I had a client tell me his daughter came home and she was really upset because her and her boyfriend broke up after two weeks. And the father's exact response was like, well, what's the big deal? Wait till you get divorced after 20 years. That's nothing. You know, and... Yeah, well, and, yeah, and there was no empathy because he kind of laughed at it and thought it was a joke. But we have to remember to think like a teen, which is those things are a big deal because they they don't have coping skills. They're just learning. Everything is a trial. You know, it's a trial run. And they just need to learn and build their resiliency and build their coping skills and build that toolbox of stuff to use as an adult. So what I find that works is really instead of, you know, fighting your child or rolling your eyes and not communicating, it's being empathetic. So even if your child comes home and you don't understand the situation because you've never been in their shoes, even if you never went through it as a teen, it's still important to be an empathetic listener. And what I always say is we can always relate to the feeling behind the story. So, yes, I might not relate to having a two-week, uh, you know, breakup and maybe I didn't even date during high school. But let's say I could still understand the breakup caused confusion. Maybe she didn't know it could, you know, brought up hurt and sadness. It might have been anger because she had no idea and she was pissed. It could bring up, you know, anything, grieving. And we can all understand the emotion behind it. So by talking to your child and saying, well, how are you feeling? And if they say, I'm angry, I'm hurt, I'm sad, I'm confused, I'm embarrassed, whatever it is, we can all relate to the feeling behind the situation. So if you can't relate to your child's situation and you can't understand it the way you want to, understand the emotions behind it. And that makes a huge difference because at least it lets them feel they're being heard. And there's a big difference between just listening and being heard. And when teens or even adults in general feel heard, they feel cared for. And that's what we want. We want our child or children to know, even if I don't understand or I've never been in your shoes, I still appreciate you telling me. I'm still open to try and understand. And I still care about your emotions and your feelings. So even if we just answer saying, hey, you know, I don't know what that feels like, but that must have been tough. Or saying, you know, I'm really sorry you had such a bad day or a bad situation. What can I do to help? Or I don't understand, but I would love to, so please tell me more. Answering in an empathetic way makes a huge difference in the conversation, the dynamic of the conversation, and it lets the children know that they're being heard and cared for. And I think that makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And they're likely to come back. Because I, um, I think one of the things that I see with my clients, um, I always, like, I'm not big on labels, so I'm not big on diagnosing someone, like, not at all. And so um, when, yeah, I'm not big on that. And I always tell people, I was like, you have a communication problem or you have a problem-solving problem or you have a decision-making problem. Like, you lack those skills. And I pull that out, and I always start with asking my clients about, like, well, what happened when you would try to go talk to your parent about, like, your grades in school? And I think some of the modeling that parents probably don't realize is it's even things like that. Hey, they want to come and talk about their report card. They want to come and talk about struggling with class, whether it's math or science or reading, and it's your reaction on that. 
your reaction with that car time talk or your reaction about this all makes a difference. And because of the brains, we all know their brains are still growing. The parents, the brains are still growing. And so <laughs> because of that capacity, they're not able to say, oh, that one event doesn't mean that she's going to or he's going to respond the same on the other event. In their brains, they literally believe that. They believe that one means you're going to act the same way with every single thing I tell you. Right, and they do. And we also have to remember and tell parents, the kids' brains don't fully develop till 25. So just because they're 16 right. or 18 and we think we could treat them a certain way, you're, it's a great point to bring up. It's still till 25 before your brain is, you know, and you're really an adult. And the other thing is knowing your child and knowing their maturity level because we can have a 16-year-old who acts like a 20-year-old and you can have a 20-year-old who acts like they're 12. So it's knowing the maturity level, what they can handle, and what's going on? So one of the best things is knowing your child. That makes a huge difference in what you say to them, how you treat them, and how you respond to their situation, especially negative ones. Mm-hmm. I agree. And so I think that's a part of that modeling and just and recognizing that. And I think it all goes back to, like you were saying, like reflecting, self-reflecting. And so, um, Diane, I know you got some books that, like, spoke about um, – just this very thing when it comes to what you model and, and, and what that means. So I want to talk a lot to modeling. If you are that parent and you're like, well, that didn't fit me. I'm actually, you know, I'm very attentive to my child. And I'm, I'm this, but I, I want now to have my turn in life. But I still want to model being present. So I know, Diane, you have some great books where it comes to, like, you know, just tapping into your own dreams as parents. And so how can, how, how can parents – um, model next phases in life that life isn't over because you're a parent. <laughs> like we've never heard that before. Sure? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, I know. Life, life changes. <laughs> right, Normal. life definitely changes when you become a parent. If anyone tells you differently, they're lying. <laughs> exactly, they're totally lying. Don't fall for it. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it definitely changes, but it's not over. <laughs> no, and so, no. like, let's talk about those things that, like, how. Yeah. So let's talk about those things when it comes to, like, um, inside of your book, when it comes to this parent that did strive for more, this mother that did push more, and how that's actually modeling something. Sure. Um, So my first book was called Baby Steps, the Path from Motherhood to Career. And it was really about making the decision, if you should go back to work, how to make the decision, and what type of work or career do you want to do now that you have children. And one of the things I always hear from clients, from moms, is, you know, how do I know if I should continue working after a child? How do I know if I should go back? Because there's, you know, that decision-making right after you have a baby and you take maternity leave, do I want to go back? Or if it's you took time off and, you know, it's two or three years or five years later. And one of the things I always say, and this talks right into the role modeling as we talked about, is what's going to make you the best parent or mom you can be? That's really the most important question because if, if you go back to work and that's going to make you happy, then it's definitely worth going back because a positive parent equals a positive child. So if you're really happy going back to work, then that's what you should do. If you're happy being a stay-at-home mom, unless you don't have the choice and you need to go back to work, then that's what you should do. So it's an individual decision. It should not be based on what your parents did. It shouldn't be based on what society says or what you know, your religious or your cultural background says it's really a personal choice of what's going to make me a better person, what's going to bring me overall happiness so I can be the best person I can be. Because if you come home from work and you're miserable and they see that and you don't have time and you're frustrated and you're irritable, then it's not going to make you the parent you want to be. So it's really an individual choice if you have that option. But we can definitely, you know, I'm not saying you can, you know, you talked about balance. I don't know if you can actually have it all, but you can have it really close to where you can be happy and have a good balance in your life. And also by showing your kids that you're happy by doing certain things allows them, like it shows girls, little girls especially, that they can go out and work and be a mom because it used to be that you couldn't. So we're actually allowing them to see that there's more to you don't just have to be a mom if that's not all you want to be. And there's nothing wrong with having both a career and being a mom. They're both wonderful experiences. But it's really what makes you the better person and what makes you the happiest really makes you just make that decision. Yeah, you probably can't um, balance it all. That's probably my problem. <laughs> I'm sure that's, I'm sure that's what I'm like. Right, I'm just like, gosh. <laughs> 
but but you're absolutely right and i think um i think the guilt i've um i've not like since i work with a lot of university students that they've been my primary um but i have a lot of like the the range it varies a lot and and i've heard a lot of the from my older clients who have been in their 50s who are raising like well their maybe their kid is in college as well because they're in their 50s I've heard them make the comment at, by saying that, like, now it's my turn. You know, I've kind of did it all for them, now it's my turn. But I think they can really turn that conversation around and not to kind of model, because I think, like you said, it goes back to the words. What are you saying? Because those, like, those comments, those nonverbal cues are actually messages. And so it begins to have a message that, again, life is over and and so when I think people think life is over, I think they're not as self-aware of, like, what they're showing others or showing particularly their children. Well, it's true because your belief system on anything, whether it's parenting, aging, health, whatever it is, relationships, your belief system really causes you to act a certain way. So if it's a subconscious limiting belief. So if you really believe parenting means it's over, because maybe that's what you heard from your parents or that's what society's making you feel, if you keep that belief system, it's going to come out in your actions and your words. So sometimes you have to even dive in and go, what is my belief system? Especially if you're about to have a child or you're thinking of having a child or you just did have a child. In the beginning is the time to think about it of, what is my belief system on this? And is it, is it a limiting belief? Is it a realistic belief? Is my belief a fact? Because just because you have a belief doesn't mean it's a fact. It could just be based on hearing something over and over again that causes that feeling. So really challenging the belief and making sure it works for you and it's not setting you up for failure is really important. So really ask yourself that question. What do I think about parenting? What is my belief system? And it might be that, you know, I can't work, I have to stay at home or I'm not a good mom. And then challenging that. Is that really a good belief? You know, because for me, I knew going to work was going to make me a better mom because I wanted to continue working. I love my daughter and I love my career and together that makes for a better life for me but it's always up to the person individually. So not trying to live somebody else's life either because your mom did that or you think you have to. It's making a decision that works best for you. I agree. I agree. I love that. I I think, like, and and I think that shows growth, and I think that's being a student. And so so what other words of encouragement would you give if we are trying to break some cycles that parents are actually having um, when it comes to some other tips Oh, I I know. I wanted to mention the positive reinforcers. Oh, my goodness. I almost (laughs) forgot that. Um, (laughs) So let's talk briefly about that. So um, First Nation family, like positive reinforcers and negative reinforcers is something that really, really works. Like we didn't make it up, but it really works. I've used it on my son. Um, He favors more of the positive reinforcers, (laughs) of course, um, than he does anything. But for our young kids and our, our tweens, I believe it can work. Um, it's something very important. So um, could you talk briefly about, like, a, what a positive reinforcer or a negative reinforcer would look like when it comes to modeling and teaching our kids and parents? Sure. So, you know, we have to remember this. Positive reinforcement works well, not just for young kids, teens, but even as adults. That's what we use in the workforce to motivate. Yep. But the problem is as adults is we use more money base. And what we really need, money is important, bonuses, those are all great. But really what makes somebody really happy at work is the praise. You're doing such a great job. Thank you for this great work. Can you do more of it? You know, that's the stuff that works. So I'm more of a fan of positive reinforcement, and that's what we use in positive psychology. So I'll just give an example. Um, I have parents who are working with young kids up to teens, and they can't get them to do a certain thing. Maybe it's, you know, clean their room. I'm just going to use that as an example. So what we did is we set up a board in the refrigerator um, that so everybody could see, and the kitchen's usually the hub of the house for most people. And I called it a pause board. And why I called it that is because we had um, my clients use a paw print, like a a sticker, to use it. So we called it the pause board. And what happened is we put our board up with Monday through Sunday on it, and every time the child did that behavior, which is clean their room, they would get to put the sticker on the pause board. And after a few weeks, it was two weeks, because you don't want to do positive reinforcement too quickly. If you do it every other day, it loses 
it loses its value and they want more and more. So you could be every two weeks, every three weeks, whatever it is, depending on the child's age and maturity and what you're working on. But every time they put the sticker up themselves and the parents would give praise at that time, such a great job, I'm so proud of you. And then in two weeks, the child got to pick from a, a box of positive reinforcement. And it was just very simple things because these were young kids. They went to the dollar store and picked out stickers and pencils that smelled, you know, those smelly pencils and, you know, nail polish and really small, cheap things because you don't want to do too much because then the child wants more again. And they would get to pick that out. And if they kept the behaviors going for, if I remember correctly, with this one client it was three months because to really form a habit takes about two and a half, three months. Then at the end of the three months, they got to pick out whatever dinner they wanted at a restaurant and they would go, you know, whether it was McDonald's or a Pizza Hut, you know, it didn't matter what it was. But then they got that really big reward. The thing with doing the positive reinforcement is you only want to do one behavior at a time. Otherwise, it's too confusing, especially for younger kids. They need to have the focus and attention. So whichever behavior you pick, you want to work on that one only. You want to work on it for at least two to three months so it really kicks in and becomes a habit. You want them to get a reward, but it's a reward that works for them. So it's not a reward we pick. It has to be something that they'll enjoy. Otherwise, it doesn't work. It has to be something, you know, really towards them. And that really makes a big difference. You need the praise, the positive reinforcement reward. You need the length of time and only one behavior at a time. And then you can move on to another behavior if you need to. But that positive reinforcement, I've noticed with my clients, and I also used to use it when I worked at a rehab with traumatic brain injury clients and older adults who've had, you know, some disabilities, and it worked just as well with the adults. So, it's really another important tool, and you don't have to use it as a pause board. You can use stickers. You can have just a check, a star, especially knowing their age. Um, you can pick different rewards, different forms of praise, but it's just important to keep it consistent as well and really stick to it. Like if, if they don't do a whole week, you know, let's say for two weeks like I did with my client, if they don't do the, the assignment every day by cleaning their bed, you can't give in and give them the reward anyway in two weeks, and it has to start all over again. So you can't give in either. So you have to be consistent, and you have to stick with what you're doing. Right, and the Dollar Tree, those prizes go a long way. <laughs> that oh was my son. They right. go a Especially long candy way. Candy or like little sucking yes. candies or gum or yep. stickers, smelly pencils, Post-its. I mean, there's mm-hmm. just so much little things you don't have to spend a lot of money. Or one of my clients would do after two months, if they did well, they got to go and get ice cream. Again, not a lot of money, yep. but enough that mm-hmm. they really have something to look forward to that's important to them and keeps them motivated along with the praise in between and the consistency. Yeah. yeah, and and that's and that's modeling. That is something that's positive modeling, and that allows parents um, one to reflect on you being consistent. Well, you being consistent, and it allows um, it allows them secondly to reflect on themselves and 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 why it's happening, or to take a step back and and maybe during that time, I know for my son when he was. Um, having lots of behavior problems it was because we were switching schools. Like we're in, we do private schools, and private schools in Georgia and public schools in Georgia are like really hard to find out which one is going to be the best for your child. And he's a young male, and so I had to really, really do a lot of homework. So unfortunately, I bounced him around. Well, he was negatively responding one because I was getting so frustrated, and secondly because he was struggling to adjust in. And so when I put a lot of reinforcements, it allowed me time to talk to teachers. It allowed me time to reflect off of what I was giving out as well. And so I think it works both ways. Like we're both getting some type of positive um, reinforcer back. Yes, absolutely. It's a two-way street. I agree. And, you know, the more praise and positive reinforcement we get, the more we feel the reward because we see their behavior change, we see them happier, and in return we're happier and we're less frustrated and less stressed about it. So it, it is a win-win on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so, Dan, before we get out of here, I know we didn't talk about negative reinforcement. The negative reinforcement, y'all, is just, just that. Like um, it's actually things taken away. So 
we probably use more negative reinforcers than we do positive, to be honest. <laughs> and so probably. you probably just didn't know the term of it. <laughs> but, uh, but we often are constantly taking video games away, taking things away. You can't go outside. You can't do this. Those are negative reinforcers. And so um, a lot of people in our field have actually found that positive reinforcers and being consistent actually work more favorable. Absolutely, because you're working on the positive and you're promoting their strengths instead of their weaknesses. You know, I'm going to pull that video away because you didn't do good in school. Instead of, wow, if you do great on this test, you know, for a few weeks and giving them the praise. And, you know, a big thing is praising the effort, not the grade. And that's a big thing to remember, too, talking about that, not to cut my own self off. But, you know, we always tell people to praise, especially with school. So they'll praise, you know, oh, you did so well, you got an A, or, you know, wow, you guys did so well in that sport, you got, you know, you got number one. But that's not really what's important. What's important is the effort that they put in, even if they only got a C-plus on that paper, but you saw them try 100% and they really put the effort in and they improved from before, that's really what matters. So really mm-hmm. work on the effort, not the grade per se, because when we yeah. just reward the grade, then they think they have to continue on that. And there's going to be times yeah. they don't do well because we all have weaknesses and we all have bad days, so we want to promote pushing the strengths and encouraging mm-hmm. the effort. Really, that's the big thing. Yeah, and it's not very realistic. I think, like, one thing about, like, modeling, and that goes back to being human, it's we mess up. Like, we have bad attitudes. Yes, parents, we do. <laughs> we have bad <laughs> attitudes. We have moments. Oh, my goodness, go figure. We have moments, too. And so, and we don't always get every answer. We don't always know every answer. And I think being humble is like the best thing in the world. Being a student is like the best thing. And I think that's something that like, you know, this whole um this whole conversation is definitely reminding me of, even with myself. Like I'm always it's always okay to keep learning and keep like, you know, reflecting. Absolutely. I agree. And the more we keep, you know, having that self awareness and learning, the more we grow. And then we're not stuck or stale and we're stepping out of our comfort zones and it brings more happiness. So it's all a win win. Yep. Yes, I agree. So Diane, tell us First Nation where they can find you and, and how can they purchase those books for all those thriving moms and, and people who just want to grab more to um supporting what you do. You can reach me at my website which is dlcounseling.com and you can find my books on there or you can find them at the website where the publisher is which my new book is Sentia Publishing or they're all on Amazon which is probably the easiest place to find everything so I'd say my website or Amazon and you can see you know all of my books and thank you again for having me as a guest it's always a great conversation with you it's, it really is just mm-hmm. so much fun talking to you so thank you for having me I know that's how I feel too <laughs> Thank you so much for for joining me and being on it. And so Source Nation, that is Diane Lang, and we are on our new series of positive um, parenting, modeling positive parenting. And so continue to join me and continue to tune in um, as we just really just break the cycle of being silent when it comes to communicating and how family systems are ran. And so I do hope you join me next week and on Source Radio Network for Family Mix Mondays.